I'm a researcher at UC Davis, and I study different aspects of environmental science. I'm a co-director of the Road Ecology Center. I've been involved in uh, understanding contamination and policy issues around fish contamination, especially in terms of environmental justice. And uh, then I've done a fair amount of work in watershed analysis. And more recently, the, uh, the report card uh, looking at different aspects of watershed condition, including social and economic, so human um, aspects of, of condition. And that's the kind of basis of the talk today. I want to acknowledge uh, a lot of people on this acknowledgement slide associated with the three projects that I'm going to use as the basis for this discussion. Uh, Sacramento River Water Project had a grant to uh, understand how to use a report card in the Sac River Basin. Napa River Watershed Project, which was focusing on the North Bay. Uh, Southern California, uh, which was led by the LA San Gabriel River Watershed Council. And the names listed there and the organizations were all uh, helpful in developing these ideas and conducting these projects. And then a crew of graduate students and uh, um, technical programmer help uh, listed there, there at the bottom. So I've done any of this without them. I'll start out with some uh, basic information, uh, such as definitions. And so when I use the terms here, indicators and metrics, I mean something that we can measure around us that tells us something about condition of a natural system or a human system. Uh, when I use the term performance measure, I'm, it's similar in meaning to indicators, but I'm applying it to uh, management actions or other human activities, such as restoration. And then finally, the term index, uh, meaning an aggregation of indicators, some kind of aggregation. It could be an average sum that conveys an overall story about a system that's uh, in question. Some assumptions. The first one is not listed, and that is that we even need a, a report card or report cards of some kind. Uh, that's a, a reasonable question to ask. It's not listed here. Uh, but the four main ones here are, are four main assumptions, or five main assumptions. Reporting status and trends in condition according to social goals. So what do pe people expect? So that's an important thing is, is we're reporting according to people's expectations. Uh, so one is that science is the basis of the report card, whether it's social science, ecological science, uh, hydrology, et cetera. Third, uh, that measuring system performance, so the natural system performance relative to targets. So some idea of what we're expecting or desiring, and we're seeing how things are doing relative to those expectations. Fourth, that we can aggregate indicator scores somehow to tell us about a, a whole watershed condition or about a particular goal that we have, for example, water management, and that the aggregation has some basis in statistics and logic, et cetera. And fifth, and um, most importantly, is that we're measuring aspects of the whole system. And so the pie chart here that shows different ways of, or one way of breaking up this idea of a whole system into natural and human components. So what do we need in order to be able to do this? This is not an all-inclusive list. This is some of the things that I've thought of. Uh, is that you have a scalable system. So we can we can collect data at a very point or reach resolution, an individual school, an individual monitoring site. And then we want to make statements about larger areas. So that's, a, that's the function of a report card quite often is that you're reporting at a larger area. So we need sc a scalable system to do this. And if we scale up through regions and the state, we can event contribute to the idea of a national report card, which doesn't have to have the same indicators throughout the country, but some consistency in structure. The second one is that we have a comprehensive way of organizing information. So we're looking at different attributes of, of systems, and we're organizing the information in a logical and consistent way, consistent across uh, or among regions that are being studied in terms of report cards. The third is that we're reporting on conditions relative to standards and goals. And so we need to have those standards. They could be legal water quality standards. They could be a social goal about water management and sustainability. But to have those, we can compare the existing conditions to those. Um, and then some kind of process. And I listed six steps in a process here that we went through in the watershed assessment framework projects, uh, starting out with goals. Uh, then we have measurable objectives that correspond to those goals. 
And once you have measurable objectives, you can link to indicators and metrics, things that are being measured in the environment, either because you want them to be measured for your report card or they are incidentally being measured by somebody else, and you can collect that information. Fourth is evaluation of some reporting area. So it could be a watershed, it could be a county. Uh, evaluation of the condition in that reporting area using those indicators. Fifth, evaluation of your goals. So that's going back to that first step. Seeing how well you're doing relative to the goals using the indicators. So if you have indicators for water supply, you can see how well are we doing for managing water supply in a sustainable manner. Finally, reporting condition and success in reaching the goals and understanding condition to the public and decision makers. And I think this is a really essential uh, part of the whole reporting process is stepping outside the scientific and technical arenas and helping people to understand how we're doing. Well, I'm going to take a little stop there, and if anybody wants to press stop six and ask a question or electronically ask the chat box, then just go ahead and do that. Okay? So through steps in developing your report card, and several years ago, uh, there was a work group at this, uh, in the state um, operating, let's see, there was a group of departmental PDs that got together to respond to a governor's directive to develop a watershed strategic plan. And the main item in that was to figure out how to do report condition in a, in a structured way for the state. And several options were were looked at. The one shown here is the one that was finally adopted, and I think that was in about 2006, 2007, uh, which is based on the US EPA Science Advisory Board's framework. So this is a framework from the US EPA uh, that you could understand natural system condition. So the uh, um, uh, cited figure, which is a hexagon, hexagon uh, pie chart in the middle, shows different ways of uh, different categories of natural system condition. And attached to those are lists of potential stressors, things that could change the condition in that natural system. It's an important combination is condition indicators and stressor indicators. And that was uh, developed by the SAB, the Science Advisory Board of the US EPA. So that was adopted and modified uh, by the state uh, to develop the watershed assessment framework. And I could actually replace that term watershed with any natural jurisdictional unit. It could be the county assessment framework or the uh, bioregional assessment framework. Really the idea was to divide up the natural system, use the, S the US EPA's division of the natural system into landscape condition, biotic condition, ecological processes, et cetera, and add in two additional uh, condition categories, economic condition and social condition. And I felt it was very important to reflect the uh, uh, the really the role of humans not only in benefiting from um, natural system conditions, but in influencing them and being tied in closely to uh, the condition of natural landscapes and their own communities. So this is for, for how we organize the information. It became the basis for a grant program uh, funded by the Department of Water Resources, or really operated by the Department of Water Resources using bond funds. And there were six projects throughout the state I think about two and a half million was spent over a, uh, originally intended to be a two and a half year period, it's now going to be about a three and a half year period because of the freeze last year. And there were 20 funded entities throughout the state. Uh, each of the projects spread among the six projects. Each project had a regional technical advisory committee with anywhere from 10 to 20 organizations. So there were, there were fairly, uh, let's say 150 organizations or so throughout the state that were invested in this process over the last three years. Talk um, about my experiences from three of these. I worked with the Sac River Watershed Program project, the uh, the one led by Napa County for the North Bay, and then the Southern California project led by LA San Gabriel River Watershed Council. The this, the approach that was adopted, uh, that was the basis of this program, was it a, bless, a blessing at a um, national level, and so it's more likely that we could be consistent with other states. Uh, that we were using guidance that um, a lot of thinking had gone into, and so there was um, a reason for that, that uh, selecting it as that, but also because 
the approach had a sound scientific basis, which was recorded in the Science Advisory Board's recommendation. It's scalable, which is very important, uh, whether thinking from a state level or a national level, where you could have a local scale, a watershed or sub-watershed, a regional scale, such as a river basin or a, um, or a cog region or a bioregion, a uh, state scale and national scale. The WAF approach uses available information and aggregates that. It could also be done periodically and use new information, so it's it's whatever information is available at the time. It uses a combination of ecological and social and e economic attributes, the basis for reporting, so we're really looking at the whole system. And uh, the reporting is simple. So it's a consistent presentation, a treatment of information to simplify the reporting, not simplify the analysis so that people can understand uh, the outcome. So it's not a it's not a scientific expression. It's a intended to be accessible to people regular people. So here's an example. This is a sub-region report card uh, in the Sac River watershed. The Feather River was the Feather River watershed was the focus of uh, this pro project. And the goals, objectives, uh, condition scores, and trends are all shown in the table here. <coughs> and our confidence in the findings. And so after two and a half years or so of analysis, we had obtained goals from stakeholders and objectives. We analyzed the available data uh, using indicators corresponding to those objectives. We looked at trends in those indicators, and then we also applied our own confidence in, in our own findings. This is the uh, table for the uh, um, equivalent project in the North Bay led by Napa County. And you might see in um, both is, so I'm going to point you to third goal here down, conserve, protect, and improve native plant, wildlife, and fish habitats in their communities. And then on this one, uh, protect and store native animals and plants. The fair amount of consistency <coughs> among the projects in terms of the goals selected without communication about the goals. So stakeholders in different regions selected uh, um, fairly, the goals overlapped fairly well among the regions which was interesting and maybe not surprising. So protecting water supply, uh, geomorphic process, uh, community condition, economic condition, uh, there was a fair amount of overlap. The individual indicators might vary, and certainly the data being used would be quite different, um, but the goals were very similar, which allowed for some comfortability among the regions. And this uh, one shows the scorecard in more detail. Uh, the, the watersheds were broken up into subregions, and so in the center of this table you see watershed subregion condition score. And so the Napa River watershed was broken up into five subunits, uh, which were analyzed separately, and then those were combined into an overall watershed condition score. <coughs> so the outcome of this project is a report card that can delay condition to common language goals that we might have, like protecting water supply or protecting uh, native habitats. So I'm going to give you an opportunity to ask questions. If anybody has a question they want to throw out there. We have a, uh, more callers. It looks like we have more callers than we have people on the webinar. Um, I, think, uh, I think people can email Eric uh, if they are having trouble getting on the WebEx. Eric, are you mute? Can you tell your uh, email address really quickly if anybody wants to do that? And my email is e v u r r e s at waterwords c a g o v. Often we have people that call in, and then it takes a while for them to join us through the web, Fraser. Okay. I won't worry about it. All right. Thank you. So there, uh, some of the process steps that we went through. Uh, so you can see how those went. And first, uh, which really sets the stage, is describing the goals and objectives. And then involved in every case, uh, folders within the region, um, folder documents, so things that people had written, planning documents, uh, say, for example, IRWMP or uh, regional board base plan or other documents that stated goals for the natural and human systems uh, in the area. So those were goals and objectives. They were not selected by the project teams, per se. They were selected by stakeholder advisors. 
Here's an example. Uh, this is, I think, from Napa, the Napa County Project. Improve aquatic habitat for some monsters and other native species. So that goal, uh, it's not immediately apparent how you would measure it. Uh, the, <coughs> the objectives are um, to maintain or reduce stream temperature, improve stream cover and complexity, maintain areas of clean, clean gravel. So that's taking goal and breaking it up into objectives and saying, what are the things that um, we want to get out of this goal or that we can measure about this goal to look at our progress. And each of these has components such as maintain or reduce stream temperature that uh, you can measure in the wild, which makes, uh, therefore makes them reportable, and so you can look at conditions relative to your goal. So the goal and objective statements which are obtained from the stakeholders, corresponding indicators, and uh, then also things that are might modify conditions. So we stress or observe things that will influence the ecological conditions or the social conditions. So we listed candidate indicators. Those again were passed by stakeholder uh, stakeholders in each process, technical advisors and other stakeholders to let us know which indicators they thought were important. Uh, and then we had a back and forth discussion about that, which included things like availability of data and um, whether this indicator would tell us anything. Uh, example of indicators that correspond to the objectives I just showed you. So we have goal statement broken into objectives, and each objective <coughs> has corresponding indicators or metrics, things that we can measure in the environment <coughs> that tell us how we're doing relative to those objectives and therefore relative to that goal. Finally, uh, unless your indicators are metrics, you would break the indicator down and say, what are the actual th things that people measure? Uh, so you could say that my indicator is fish populations, but there's metrics within that statement of fish population, things that you actually measure, and then sources that correspond to that, to those metrics. So, and actually I'll, I, I skipped a step, but I'll show you later the analysis. So you have your list of metrics and data sources, but there's some, and so and I'll, I'll go into that in a little bit. Um, but the final step is to report on the conditions. And this is the taking the um, fairly large amount of technical information uh, and and then the corresponding analyses and saying, what did we find out in terms of condition relative to a standard or threshold or uh, other reference? And then reporting that to people so that it's both reflective, so that what you're reporting is both reflective of the complexity of the underlying science and the underlying system, it's easy to understand. And so that's sort of the holy grail of report cards is uh, giving something graphically and, and intellectually accessible to a large number of people without uh, having a so upstream effect on your analysis. So you don't want to simplify the analysis, but you do want to simplify the presentation. And I think it's to do that for all of the last projects. And um, important questions within reporting. Uh, what are effective ways to do that? So what is what are the ways that have been tested or uh, used in the past that we think are effective for for conveying uh, technical information? What scale are we reporting? Uh, so uh, subwide or regional scale. What level of detail is needed within a report card? So should it be a very simple uh, should bar red to green, or should you go into detail about the um, scores of individual subregions? And to do the, the reporting, and uh, so what is the entity in the region or in the watershed or in the county that is considered fairly neutral and uh, hold the report card uh, long term and um, report out? And so that could be a non-governmental organization uh, such as Heal the Bay or um, Sacrificial Program that is uh, um, stakeholder involvement and and in them can carry on a reporting uh, structure. So here are some examples that we considered. Uh, these aren't necessarily exact ones that we used, but uh, we looked at the very simple graphic of uh, red to green or similar change in color uh, along a symbol to say something about um, condition. And so it, it's roughly what condition is. is. So red is usually conditions bad and green is conditions good. Uh, the arrows are intended to convey a trend up or down over time. This one is one that was actually used in the Sac River project. So it conveys more information. It breaks 
uh, come down according to the goals for condition, so that's on the far left. It gives condition statement, which is the scores that are in the third column, and trend for the condition. Uh, this is from actual um, data analysis. How are things going? Are they going up or down and not changing? Or was the trend, uh, could it be determined at all? And then finally, our confidence. And this is something you don't see very often in report cards, but we felt was important across the projects, was saying uh, whether we had low to high confidence in our own finding. And not to, if, if not included, then implicitly you're saying we think we know, um, we think we have high confidence in, in our finding. Another one that's been used in the Southern California environmental uh, environment scorecards is a narrative description. And so to recruit an expert uh, to describe conditions uh, for, I think it was water supply in Southern California and drought, and uh, to spend four or five pages describing conditions and then to give a grade, and uh, in this case, B plus for that year. And then this is an example from Southeast Queensland. Uh, is to, to, to graphically display results, uh, so report card grades, uh, just on a map. And, so, and, and actually, the way that they have it, uh, you can click and drill down into each of these sub-watersheds and discover where the score came from. Uh, but it um, shows it in, a, in this map graphic display uh, uh, in quite contrast to a, a text or narrative description of conditions. Uh, one thing that uh, we was um, important was to make a nexus between the score that's derived and the um, school management responses, or way, or how did the how did we get to that condition, and what could we do about it? So, if they uh, poor native fish habitat condition, um, what response that we could have uh, to, to improve it? Only with landscape, if there's poor landscape condition, what is what is a land use or other kind of decision making that could improve or lead off a downward trend in in a poor con or fair condition? And so the report card useful as a decision making device and not just a educational device um, for a newspaper <coughs> newspaper publication. One of the important uh, important advances that we made was the relationship between the uh, goal and objective statements on the far left. So this is, this is simplifying. These aren't actual goals and objectives, obviously, but these are the idea of getting goals and objectives from stakeholders and showing the relationship between the goals and objectives and the ecological attributes across the top or social attributes. So you've got landscape condition, biotic condition, et cetera, all the way over to social condition and economic condition. So those sort of scientific or fairly dry ways of categorizing uh, the whole system into parts. And then that have a, an obvious relationship to social goals, which are on the y-axis. Uh, but the individual indicators do allow you to crosswalk. And that was the uh, one of the advances we made was show how the indicators provided you a way of linking between a um, sort of an academic or agency categorization of condition and, and linking that to a social goal, a narrative statement that people can relate to more easily about salmon or water supply. Um, and then you could derive scores, aggregated scores for goals or for those um, attributes in either direction, either axis. So reporting in two dimensions. And then you could do this, uh, you do this for each sub-watershed or for each watershed, depending on how you're how your geographic scaling. So here I'm close to the end now. I'm going to walk you through the example from the Feather Basin. Uh, I do want to invite questions again. Nobody has any? Don't forget it's uh, R6 if you want to unmute it. Feel free to interrupt. So show an example of, of uh, an, um, one of these projects uh, in the state, and this is from the Sac River, where we focused on the Feather River Basin. It's got a mixture of land uses, water management, um, it has salmon, it has active watershed and restoration groups, history of monitoring, and a mixture of private and public lands. And so it was a, it's representative of a lot of conditions in the state. It's very large. Uh, the whole Sac River is about 20%, uh, sorry, I think it's about 15% of 
the state of California. The Feather River Basin is about 20% of the uh, Sac River watershed. So the Feather River watershed by itself is about 3% the size of California. So it's a fairly large subunit of the state uh, to look at. For, uh, there are sub-watersheds within the Feather, and we used those as our analytical units. And so we broke up the uh, available data into those subunits and analyzed them separately. Uh, so we had conditions for each of the 11 sub-watersheds. We could then create those into um, a watershed condition or a whole, whole Yuba watershed condition, depending on what was desired by um, follow-up stakeholder use of the, the uh, document. Goals and objectives were obtained um, using regional uh, stakeholder documents and also a regional technical advisory committee. Maintain of water quality and supply for humans' natural use, protect and enhance native aquatic and terrestrial species. And underneath each goal statement is a list, one to five or one to four or six of the objectives. And those are all the measurable objectives that I referred to earlier. Protect and enhance landscape and habitat. Um, restore natural disturbances that um, balance benefits for natural and human communities. <coughs> Maintain and improve social and economic conditions including benefits from healthy watersheds. So these goals and objectives were used to derive the indicators that were used. There was a fairly long list of indicators. All that's shown here is the actual indicators that we ended up using, which went through a um, set of criteria, about 10 criteria. Uh, I see a question from Abdul, and I'll um, ask you to answer that in a second. Um, there's a a set here that we use to limit the set of indicators. And so the lit indicators shown on the far right were the ones that were actually used in the Feather River example. One of the challenges that we had that I think are true of any uh, reporting uh, report card process, uh, and we solved most of them, uh, was the amount and availability of data. And when I first wrote that on this slide, I, th I thought, well, that might sound like we didn't have enough data. And that was sometimes true. But the example I show here is that for temperature, water temperature, we had about half a million records uh, for 162 sites. And so we had the, we had the problem in the other direction uh, in terms of amount for that particular parameter. Um, trends analysis, quite often this is regarded as either impossible or one should just do linear regression. Uh, we used a broadly accepted uh, type of analysis called it's a Mann-Kendall analysis, a statistical test, where you can control for multiple sites within a region. You can uh, control or at least understand uh, periodicity in a, in a in a put of value. So, for example, water temperature will vary seasonally, and you can control for that. So you can understand trends over time, over years, while controlling for seasonality. Uh, this one here, distance to target, and that's how far away is your condition from the condition you think it should be. Uh, it's a very important um, area and one that we solved. And that sometimes you have nonlinear response curves, and I'll show an example of that if that's not immediately clear. So statistical analysis over time, um, you could have a set of data where you have up and down variation, maybe seasonal or diurnal. And measuring uh, trend depends on which set of points and how you control for the, for the periodicity in the data. But you really want to find out whether or not you have a significant trend. Uh, so we use the Mann Kendall family, seasonal Kendall, regional Kendall uh, test. Um, they were custom applications in R, which is a, a statistical uh, programming software, which is open source. Anybody can use it. Uh, and there was that you have nonlinear responses in some cases between the thing you're interested in uh, and so. Um, if you're interested in water temperature, for example, fish don't respond in a linear fashion to an increase in temperature. They have a nonlinear response. Uh, so the example there, the water temperature scaling curve, is the response of fish to increasing temperature. Uh, and so really the blue dots could represent survival rates. As you increase temperature beyond a certain point, you have a nonlinear decay of survival rates. And so our scoring, so y-axis there, the score, uh, was based on that idea of the nonlinear response. Uh, so the difference between 17 and 19 degrees might be a very minor change in score, but between 19 and 21 would be a bigger change in score because of that nonlinear response of the of fish or other biota to water temperature. 
Um, since the target, this is a, a cell used, maybe never used in reporting, but is um, certainly available as a uh, theoretically in the literature, and that and should be a sort of a no-brainer. And that is, how far away are you from your desired condition? So, what is the distance between the condition today and where it should be, or where it shouldn't be? And you would score accordingly. So, for water quality standard, you usually want to stay above that standard. Uh, if you're approaching it, then you have a degrading condition, but you can measure distance from that standard, and you can also measure your distance from a desired condition, which might be very good water quality as opposed to water that's barely squeaking by the standard. So distance to target, a distance to reference condition, um, if, you, you, if all parameters are measured in terms of their distance from a desired condition, then it allows you to rescale all of your parameters to a single scale, like 0 to 1 or 0 to 100, your distance to the condition, which then allows aggregation of all the indicator values into a single index, which brings us to integrating the parts. And so how do we do that? How do we aggregate into an index? Um, there's a lot of things we have to come before that. You have to have a, a reason for doing so. So you're taking information uh, and components of the system and you're wrapping them together. And so there usually should be a reason to do so because you're going to obviously simplify your your information if you combine it with other information. Uh, so you should have a good conceptual model or other understanding of how the system works, uh, an understanding of the scale in which you're going to do that. So is it within a single watershed and you're going to combine all of your indicator values? Uh, is it a time? Is it within topic or goal? Uh, there needs to be standard or reference conditions for each indicator to be compared to, and that allows you to rescale the values, which is the distance to target idea. And so then those rescaled values, say you have a score of 40 for water quality and 50 for habitat, then um, if they're both on that same logical scale of 0 to 100, then they can be combined together. Uh, then there should be some testing process to make sure that the, the application actually made sense um, and is useful in decision making. There's an um, article, if anybody wants to catch up with me later on, it's uh, Sing It All 2008 which describes some of the methods for compositing indicators into uh, indices or an index. And a single method to do it, by the way, it's a complex process. <coughs> the system reporting uh, can be done in several ways uh, in terms of aggregating. One is to uh, sum condition into a whole watershed. In the Sac River project, we kept uh, all of the conditions uh, parsed into the individual sub-watersheds. So you can see in these maps on the right-hand side, each of the colors corresponds to a poor to good condition. And so all the sub-watersheds could be displayed in terms of their relative poor to good condition for each of the indicators. Uh, and then anybody could add those all up and say, well, the whole Feather Basin gets a score of X if they wanted to, or they could look at them separately. Uh, the table on the left, um, the condition scores that are given does add up all those scores for the individual sub-watersheds. So the condition score in that column, the central column, is conditioned for the whole Feather River Basin. You can also sum uh, your or aggregate your values to a goal or objective. So the first objective, water quality for aquatic health, was a combination of three indicators. So the condition score there is aggregation of those indicator scores both graphically, so all the sub-basins, and topically, so all three indicators are wrapped up together. So the, the scores can be combined uh, either for geography, so for uh, taking up watersheds and wrapping them up into a, a whole watershed, or they can be rolled up to a topic, like a goal that you might have for the, the place. Um, the reports themselves, uh, they had um, I think it's true for all three of the areas that I've been talking about. They had three things in com or four things in common. Uh, one is that they showed the goals, a link to the measurable objectives corresponding to those goals. The and in those measurable objectives are indicators, a condition score for the place uh, corresponding to an objective, a trend either um, not could not be determined or not applicable, uh, upward, downward, or staying the same. And finally, confidence in the finding, according to the analyst or group of analysts who are responsible for the indicators. 
web example of one of the report cards. See, there's web examples for all three. There's one I'm showing right here, <coughs> which is for the Sac River. So the URL there if anybody wants to check it out. And the URL again, and also a little model of the web reporting. And um, I think that this uh, PowerPoint will be up on the web for you to access and look at later. But this, this is our organization of um, data that would come in the back end of having an online report card where you could look at indicators individually or corresponding to goals and objectives, or you could look at them uh, by geography. So click on a subwatershed and find out scores or condition scores for that place, uh, which seem to be common ways that people access information, either because they live there or are interested in a place, or they're interested in a, in a topic, an indicator like um, how well the fish are doing. Uh, this slide here, do I think we can construct a whole system report card right now? I think so, and I think it, uh, for certain regions we can do it immediately. And if we break California into those regions, and if, say, we had eight regions or so, um, and we could have a reg we could have regional report cards, uh, which are then uh, tiered within a state um, overall reporting system. Uh, I think that the report card should be goal and objective based, and system attribute based. So we should have some sense of regional goals and objectives from stakeholders. And we can also use system attributes like landscape conditions, social conditions, as another way to organize the, the findings. The um, stakeholder process that we've used for other uh, planning processes, uh, we have the analytical tools that we need, and so it's uh, possible from both of those procedural points of view. And finally, we have uh, different nested hierarchies that we could use. Uh, an obvious hydrologic one is uh, the subwatershed to the basin to the state. Um, there are others. We could use the regional board boundaries, counties, um, eco regions. Uh, and however they're done, uh, you can roll up values geographically, and then uh, with a consistent process across the state, you have um, a way of having a consistent report card for the whole state. So that's really, in some respects, a proposal based on um, our existing uh, work with the WAF projects, water assessment framework projects. So you can contact me. And um, I have about 15 minutes left. I'm going to start out with some questions from um, Abdul, uh, unless, let's see, it's privately in the little chat box, but I think they're all, I can talk to them. The first is comparing the approach to the San Francisco Bay uh, scorecard. And I think there's some different uh, tool, um, some advances that we made that weren't present there. Uh, maybe the tools weren't available. So the distance to target approach is uh, formally using that. I think that's new. Uh, trends analyses were all uh, where you, one should use a um, something controlling for periodicity. So if you had analysis in the data, we used uh, that approach. We use the seasonal Kendall or other man Kendall tests uh, in R, and so that was uh, consistently done. Um, so, since the target and trends analysis, uh, there's probably some other differences, and there's a lot, of, obviously, a lot of similarities as well. <coughs> um, having the goals and objectives, I think, was a little different as well. Uh, the second question, actually, I'm going to go to. Carolyn, I see you have your hand up. Anytime you want to jump in. Well, uh, yeah, Sorry. thank you. I, I just I just noticed. I it. could have put this in a note. Um, I'm interested in oh, say a goal that I think you've had it up a couple times um, relating to working landscape, uh, something that isn't um, perhaps so standard. And I'm wondering um, if you if you've used that very much and whether uh, there's a lot of divergence or you can use your approach to kind of get um, kind of a, come closer to a definition that would work in different places over time. And the other question I had is whether uh, kind of how much um, participation interest you've had on say local land use agencies in, um, kind of getting involved in your information to help them make their decisions and plans. Okay. So uh there were two separate questions yeah. actually, although they could be related. I don't know. <laughs> um I think that uh, uh 
you in the in the process of of, delin or of defining goals and objectives uh, could um, include the idea of working landscapes, and actually that was part of the Sac River project. We yeah. did have a discussion of that, and and, um, and that and I you're right. I think that discussion of goals and objectives would help us get closer to, to what those mean. How do we how do we think of them? What are our goals uh, for them? And so. You know, that part of the process itself would help. And aspects of working landscapes that are going to either give you, you'll get positive condition scores because they are benefiting social or economic condition, or you might get a negative condition score because they will contribute to degrading water quality, you know, what a, right. the aspect of the water, working so, landscape is that you're And would the definition depend on what the participants in that yes. particular area want yes. to? Yes, I'd say strongly that the regions really should define, even to the watershed level or county level, should define what those mean. But it's then helpful for them to simply state uh, what those are, yeah. and so that you can um, yeah. compare among the regions if you needed to. In terms of local land use agencies, uh, the uh, Napa County led, or actually Napa County Planning Department led the North Bay effort, uh, so they um, are obviously interested in being able to use a report card and, and condition information to improve their planning. Uh, if we're an anomaly, then uh, we might <laughs> look at another area and say, does that is that the same for the Sac River? And I, I would say that it's a little less uh, less enthusiasm or less use or less knowledge of this kind of system in the Sac River Basin, and that's probably a uh, an outreach and education issue as opposed to a um, they're just never going to want to use it. I think that most, uh, we, ha we had a, some of you may know, we had a project here looking at sustainability of different Central Valley towns. A colleague of mine, Mark Lubell, uh, surveyed uh, a few municipalities in the state and in Central Valley towns, a lot of uh, staff got back to him after the, the findings came out and wanted to know how they could improve their score. And he was looking at a lot of Different things, and they included um, land use planning and, and uh, agriculture, and other things. So some of them were irritated, but but almost always they wanted to know how they could do better. So I think once the tools are there, that local land use agencies will want to use them. Uh, they want to understand what they are, especially if if they are coming from the outside. If they're coming from the inside, I think it's even better. If they're yeah. participating in the development, then they can see how it works, and they they can get over the any trust issues that there might. Sure. I like your, the fact that your approach includes uh, economic and social. Okay. Good. Good. Um, the troop, you have your hand up. Do you want to ask something? I have to press star six to unmute. Okay. Uh, feel free to interrupt. I'm going to um, answer one of Abdul Khan's other questions. The issue of aggregating indicators from a smaller to a larger area and disaggregating from a large area to a smaller area. I'll start with the first. Uh, we we had to deal with that quite a bit. Um, the uh, aggregating up um, be a little easier. The difficulty came um, that is not always available uniformly across an area. So sometimes we're faced with a concentration of sites in a in a part of an analytical area. An analytical area would be, for example, a subwatershed. And so um, aggregating the information from that uh, fairly concentrated effort to a larger area involves some uh, loss of certainty. And so we recorded that so that uh, it couldn't be assumed that there was a homogeneity of certainty. And so the more concentrated information, the more certainty. And so the concentration of information was was one of the problems we dealt with with that spatial aggregation. In terms of disaggregating from a larger area to a smaller area, uh, we never went in that direction. And I think that <coughs> that we were reporting conditions for, say, for example, a sub-watershed. You would not want to try to disaggregate that sub-watershed into smaller sub-sub-watersheds and keep that score, because the score has meaning at that larger area uh, but don't necessarily know what the meaning is at the smaller area. So disaggregation 
uh, is probably something that should be done much more cautiously. Uh, then there's a question. Oh, David Troop, do you, are you on there? I'm still. Okay. Yeah, I see you. There you go. Um, anyway, uh, going back to one of your um, earlier items, uh, I mean, getting people involved, um, I'm wondering if there's uh, been discussions about setting up any mentoring plan with uh, some local, school, local schools. Mentoring in local schools? Uh, yes. Uh, I know that in the Bay Area, there's, uh, there's been a lot of that where, um, you know, they'll basically adopt the water net or uh, take on certain tasks and collect certain information. And it, it seems like it's been a win-win uh, situation pretty much for everybody. And I think that that's um, a really good way to answer one of the earlier questions about local land use agencies is that uh, the – Educate function as a, uh, you know, if, if the kids, if the community kids are collecting the data, then the community is going to be uh, more interested in how the information is used and good decision making. Everybody becomes more invested. So I think from that point of view, it's really good. And then the educational opportunity for the kids is, is really good. I think that that's very much dependent upon the jurisdictions and their desire or ability to, uh, to facilitate that kind of program. So, you know, it's really hard to answer that from a from a statewide scale. I've encountered, I think most organizations I've encountered would would love to incorporate uh, kids in school into the learning process of overall how well are we doing this sort of the whole system report card idea, and probably at the regional and sub regional scale you'd you'd almost want to start thinking about okay so what can we assign to kids? So for the area of my research where I look at uh, wildlife movement, training children how to, in high school kids, say, for example, how to understand wildlife movement, to track wildlife, to report it, uh, is an important part of their connection to the natural world, and it's potentially useful information in um, understanding how to reduce wood kill or impacts to wildlife habitat. So I think there's definitely opportunities there. Okay. But they all are. There's quite a lot of, there's a lot of latitude in that, uh, but I think it's I think it'd be a, a really good, good, almost essential component of any reporting system like that. More than happy to uh, volunteer to throw my hat in the ring. Okay. Do you want to? Um, you have my email address, which is on the screen, and, and email me, and I can, we can follow up. Sure. Okay. Thank uh, you. Sure. Deanne has a question uh, in the box. How important do you think standardization is with respect to interpretation of status, good versus bad? It seems that there will be considerable range, especially between urban versus rural or less damaged and more damaged areas. Uh, a good example for that is in Southern California. I don't think any of them are on here, so I can embarrass them. But uh, we had really good discussions uh, with the LA San Gabriel River Water Council and stakeholders about were we comparing with good condition and historical condition or a most achievable condition or an existing condition. So there's a range of possible good conditions there in terms of standardization. And uh, we came up with the good condition was not going to be historical in the LA Basin because it was seen as entirely achievable in the time frame of our developed society, but were achievable and desirable restored conditions that could be um, looked at instead. So since the uh, region has, uh, and the, a lot of municipalities in the region have started to remove concrete from Los Angeles River, then one measure of success could be uh, some proportion of the LA River going back to a more naturalized state or natural state uh, through removal of concrete. And it's a measurable uh, type of thing uh, from a length of hard bottom channel. It's a measurable thing from a logical response point of view. And so there were different ways that you could measure uh, compared to a, des a desired and achievable condition as opposed to a, restor um, a historical condition. So yes, there'll be, rain there'll be a wide range between urban and wild areas or rural areas. And it will depend upon regional stakeholders and some kind of political negotiation for what the standards are. I have... Uh, 
Another question from Abdul. Can this approach be used for a non-watershed scale ED, say for the 10 hydraulic, hydrologic regions of the state? Uh, I think that it's as it, I don't really matters. The approach itself is, is sort of geographically, it, it's independent geography, geographic scale, both in terms of extent and uh, type of geographic extent. So I brought up counties before. I think you usually use this at a county level. One thing that will happen is if some of the things you're measuring are natural and they extend beyond a county boundary, you'd have to make a decision about cutting off your analysis at the county boundary and how much of uh, conditions outside the county you want to include in your reporting of things within the county. Um, so in using a natural scale, a hydrologic scale like a watershed or basin is a way to accommodate a lot of natural systems. Using a jurisdictional scale is going to accommodate a lot of uh, human systems and there's probably not a happy medium. Um, so I think you just kind of have to deal with it, uh, whichever scale you're using. But um, Short answer, you can apply the same method to a county or municipality just as easily, or COG region. Question here from Karen Worcester, and I think there's two minutes left, so whip your questions in there if you have any. Will you make your PowerPoint slides available? Also, would it, be help it would be helpful to, if you could get access to the matrices that we use by the various watershed programs for goals and objectives. Uh, the PowerPoint slides are all, um, I think the, the presentation is posted along with the recording. Eric can correct me if I'm wrong. And um, the goal and objective matrices, I think, are all embedded in the reports from the different uh, projects. The South California one, I'm not sure if it's a, if there's a final report available. Uh, you can email me. I can find out for you. Uh, the Pa and Sac River basins are both done in terms of final report and they have the goals and objectives and indicators all laid out in tables. That's the easiest way uh, to get access to them. Uh, so you can call me for contacts, or uh, I can't email the, the, the full reports easily because they're very large documents. They're often 30 or 40 megabytes. But if anybody wants some of those, you can email me, and I can figure out how you can get web access or, other, or an FTP download uh, of those documents.